Number 1. Johnston was last seen at Debbie Griffith's apartment at a motel in Brigham City, Utah on July 22, 1981. He had met her for the first time at a bar the previous evening, and they talked and played pool together. Rudy Matthew Ribeterano was also at the bar and was jealous because she was paying attention to Johnston. He and Griffiths had divorced in 1979 but remained friendly with each other. Ribeterano had a history of being violently jealous of any man who approached Griffiths and, several months before, had tried to run over a man who was helping Griffiths move some furniture. At 5.30 a.m. on July 22, Johnston and Griffiths went to her apartment and she asked him to escort her inside because she was afraid Ribeterano might be there. He was. Ribeterano shouted at Johnston and Griffiths quickly left the apartment, leaving the two men behind. As she did, she heard scuffling noises and a loud groan, as if someone had been hit in the abdomen. She ran outside and under a bridge across the street. From this position, Griffiths watched Ribeterano leave her apartment carrying a large white bundle, which he placed in the trunk of Johnston's 1972 Ford Torino. He drove the vehicle away, down Main Street. Griffiths called the police, who arrived at her apartment at 6.08 a.m. and found fresh blood spattered all over. The blood was type A, which is Johnston's type, Roberto Rano's blood type is OA white sheet had been removed from Griffith's bed, and several kitchen knives were missing. Later that day, Johnston's vehicle was located. There was type A blood on the rear bumper, and a large puddle of type A blood soaked into the trunk mat. A Zippo lighter and two Paul Mall cigarettes, items Johnston normally carried in his shirt pocket, were inside the trunk. On August 6, two weeks after Johnston's disappearance, a maintenance worker found a knife on the roof of the motel where Griffiths lived. Griffiths identified it as one of knives that had disappeared from her apartment the night of Johnston and Ribeterano's altercation. The knife had a spot of blood on the handle, either type A or type B, authorities were unable to determine which. Late in August, Roberto Rano took a polygraph in Johnston's case. The exam indicated he was being deceptive when he claimed he hadn't cut or stabbed Johnston. Ribeterano was subsequently charged with Johnston's murder. He claimed he was innocent and Johnston was alive. At the trial, his defense attorney admitted the two men had gotten into a physical altercation on the day of Johnston's disappearance, but said Ribeterano had simply bloodied Johnston's nose and then left. He was convicted of second-degree felony homicide and sentenced to prison. Ribeterano was released from custody after five years and now lives in Salt Lake City, Utah. Johnston's remains have never been found, but authorities are continuing to search for them. Number 2 Michelle resided on a 252-acre estate on Hagedorn Road in Oago, New York in 2001. She was in the process of divorcing her husband, Calvin Harris, at the time of her disappearance, she had filed for divorce eight months previously. A photograph of Calvin is posted with this case summary. Michelle and Calvin have four children together, and the family was all residing at the same house. Michelle's attorney said that she had obtained an order of protection from Calvin while they continued to live together. It prohibited any mental or physical abuse. The divorce was described as complicated, and Calvin did not want to end the marriage. Michelle had sexual relationships with several other men while she was married to Calvin, and Calvin had been unfaithful as well. Michelle's attorney stated she feared the power of Calvin and her in-laws, who owned several car dealerships in the local region and are considered a prominent business family. Her lawyer said that the divorce would be finalized soon and Michelle would be financially secure for the rest of her life. Calvin had offered her custody of their children and $80,000 a year for the next 10 years. Michelle's loved ones said that she was looking forward to a fresh start with her children. She had taken a job at Lefty's, a restaurant in the 400 block of Broad Street in Waverly, New York, and sometimes went to bars after work. Calvin told family members and the police that Michelle was drinking heavily and possibly using cocaine around the time of her disappearance, but Michelle's relatives and friends deny that she ever drank to excess or used illegal drugs. Her boss describes her as an ideal employee who was well-liked by her co-workers and restaurant patrons. Michelle planned to visit New York City on September 13 and 14. She told Calvin she planned to meet a former classmate from the State University of New York at Morrisville, where she'd gotten an associate's degree in business administration. Michelle told others, however, that she was going to New York City to pawn some of her jewelry, including her Rolex watch and two-carat diamond engagement ring. She was having financial problems at the time. Calvin was ordered to cover the mortgage, bills and other household expenses, in addition to giving Michelle $400 a week in spending money, 
but she had run up $16,000 in credit card debt and owed $1,000 to her children's babysitter. Michelle spent the day of September 11, 2001 with her family. She worked her evening shift and departed from the establishment at 9.30 p.m. She never arrived at her own home and has not been heard from again. Michelle's minivan, a gold 2000 Ford Windstar with New York dealer plates, was discovered abandoned on September 12 by the Harris family housekeeper. It was on the road shoulder near the entrance to the Harris property in the vicinity of the 300 block of Hagedorn Hill Road in Spencer, New York. The keys were still in the ignition. An extensive search of the area produced no clues as to Michelle's whereabouts. There has been no activity on her cellular phone, bank accounts, or credit cards since her disappearance. Tiny drops of her blood were found in the kitchen and garage of her home. There were no other indications of foul play. Calvin suggested other men in Michelle's life might have caused her disappearance. She was seeing two boyfriends at the time she went missing. On the night Michelle disappeared, she had drinks with one of her boyfriends, Michael Casper, and a friend of his, Michael Hakes, then stopped at the Barton, New York apartment of her second boyfriend, Brian Early. He said she left between 11 o'clock and 11.30 p.m. Michelle's relationship with Casper was a secret, not even her best friend knew about it. Early, who had met her in the fall of 2000, said he loved her and hoped to marry her after her divorce from Calvin was final. Authorities took a closer look at Hakes when they found out he was a convicted rapist who had served a decade in prison in Arizona. They could find nothing to tie him to Michelle's disappearance, however. Hakes, Casper and Early cooperated fully with the investigation and passed polygraphs. According to witnesses, Calvin seemed unusually calm and nonchalant about his wife's disappearance. Only a week after she vanished, he said he planned to sell all her belongings at a garage sale. Within three weeks, he rekindled a relationship with an old girlfriend. Police considered him the prime suspect in Michelle's disappearance from the onset of the investigation, but he didn't face charges in her case for years. In 2005, four years after Michelle's disappearance, Calvin was charged with murder in connection with her case. The prosecution theorized he beat her to death in her home on the day of her disappearance. A judge threw out the murder indictment in early 2007, citing flaws in the grand jury proceedings. Calvin was re-indicted on the same charge less than a month later. A blood spatter expert testified, saying the bloodstains in Michelle's kitchen and garage appeared to be fresh and their size and shape were indicative of blunt force trauma. Calvin's attorney argued there was no evidence to indicate Michelle was even deceased. Calvin was convicted of second-degree murder in June 2007. However, in November 2007, a judge overturned the conviction and ordered another trial. The judge based his decision on the testimony of a surprise witness who came forward after Calvin's conviction and claimed to have seen Michelle alive hours after Calvin supposedly killed her. The witness said she was standing at the foot of her driveway, arguing with another man. Calvin was retried in August 2009 and convicted of second-degree murder again. He was sentenced to 25 years to life in prison. But in October 2012, the conviction was overturned again. At his third trial in May 2015, the jury was unable to reach a verdict, and the judge declared a mistrial. At his fourth murder trial in the spring of 2016, Calvin waived his right to trial by jury and was tried by a judge instead. He was acquitted of all charges. Calvin and Michelle's children have supported Calvin since her disappearance, saying they fully believed in their father's innocence. Foul play is suspected in Michelle's disappearance due to the circumstances involved. Number 3. Harris was last seen at her apartment in the 2400 block of Hartford Street Southeast in Washington, D.C. on October 9, 2010. She had moved in only five weeks earlier and lived with her two sons, aged three and five. Her cousin's daughter, age eight, was visiting at the time and spent the night there. Harris disappeared sometime between 3 o'clock and 8.30 a.m. She spoke to someone on the phone at 3 o'clock and when the children woke up at 8.30 a.m., she was gone. They were asleep during the night and didn't hear anything unusual. There was no evidence of forced entry to the residence and no signs of a struggle. Harris's glasses were folded on a pillow in the bedroom, which is where she always kept them when she slept. Her purse was also left behind, but her phone and keys were missing. Her eyesight is so poor that she could not have navigated out of the building by herself without her glasses. The area of Harris's apartment building has a very high crime rate, and the building itself was not secure, its security intercom was inoperable, and Harris's apartment door was not in good shape. Harris witnessed a murder outside her apartment several days before she went missing, but there's no indication that this was connected to her case, and she hadn't acted fearful. 
she had just gotten accepted to a massage therapy school and she had an upcoming court date regarding a child support issue. Her boyfriend was out of state at the time of her disappearance. Both her boyfriend and her ex-boyfriend, the father of her sons, passed polygraphs in her case. Harris was raised in Richmond, Virginia and graduated high school there. She moved to Washington, D.C. in 2010 to be closer to her mother. She has no history of drug abuse and didn't even drink alcohol, and she wasn't having any problems with her family at the time of her disappearance. Her family does not believe she would have abandoned her children or left them unattended. Although there's no hard evidence of foul play in her case, authorities believe she's missing under suspicious circumstances. Her case remains unsolved. Number 4. Sharon resided in the 1900 block of Elderleaf Drive in Dallas, Texas. She dropped her daughter off at the Dallas area Rapid Transit, Dart, Park and Ride Station between 7 o'clock and 7.30 a.m. on June 13, 2001. The Redbird Area Depot was located less than two miles from their family's home. Sharon was scheduled to attend a training session later in the morning at Stemmons Elementary School. She taught third grade during the previous semester, and she planned to teach the sixth grade class in September 2001. Sharon never arrived for her meeting and has never been heard from again. Sharon's two college-age children asked their father, Ron Davis, to report their mother as a missing person when they failed to locate her by the evening. Ron's photo is posted with this case summary. He declined to contact authorities until the following morning. He has been generally uncooperative with authorities in the investigation into Sharon's disappearance and has also discouraged members of the media from following her case. Sharon's green 1998 Mercury Villager van was discovered abandoned on June 18, five days after her disappearance. The vehicle was parked in the Bally Total Fitness lot near the Southwest Center Mall in the Oak Cliff neighborhood of Dallas, less than one mile from the Davises' residence. One of the minivan's windows was broken, and the vehicle had been wiped clean of fingerprints. Employees at the gym first noticed a villager parked in their lot after 12 a.m. on June 14. Sharon was a member of the fitness center, but records indicated that she visited the gym for the final time during the first week of June 2001. Ron refused to discuss his wife's case with authorities until three weeks after reporting her disappearance. Sharon retained an attorney and filed for divorce from Ron on June 11, two days before she vanished. Their two children said that their parents' marriage had been troubled for several years beforehand. Ron allegedly belittled Sharon on a constant basis. Their children described his behavior towards their mother as abusive. Ron told investigators that Sharon took between $10,000 and $25,000 from their home before her disappearance. He refused to allow officers to inspect the location where the money had been hidden inside their residence. It is not clear if Sharon was carrying the cash on the day she disappeared. Ron and Sharon met in Los Angeles, California in 1980. He previously resided in Wisconsin and has children from his first marriage. Sharon was born in Mobile, Alabama and was raised in Las Vegas, Nevada and Los Angeles by her mother. She earned her master's degree in public administration from California State University. Sharon and Ron relocated to Dallas after their wedding. Their family members said that they did not know anyone in the area at the time. Ron is licensed to practice law in Wisconsin, but he never took the Texas bar exam. He was employed as a code enforcement officer with the city of Dallas. Sharon initially worked as an accountant, but she joined Ron in code enforcement shortly thereafter. She eventually changed occupations and became a counselor at the Lou Starrett Justice Center and at a jail in Hutchins, Texas, before moving on to teaching. Sharon and Ron experienced marital problems in 1985, and she left Dallas with their children. She intended to return to Los Angeles and planned to file for divorce. Sharon withdrew funds from the couple's joint checking account before her departure. She reconsidered her decision and elected to return to the marriage shortly afterwards. Ron claimed that he had been mugged outside of his office in Dallas's Rochester Park area in 1992. He filed a disability suit against the city afterwards, claiming that he was psychologically impaired as the result of the attack. The alleged mugging occurred six weeks after Ron was denied a promotion. He filed a grievance with the city concerning that incident, but he dropped the suit due to a lack of evidence. The city's attorneys eventually stopped filing motions in regards to his disability suit, and Ron was awarded five years' his back pay in 1997. Ron emerged as a political and community activist in the 1990s. He was elected to the executive board of Dallas's NAACP, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Ron was suspended by the organization's national officials after they received complaints regarding irregularities in the 1999 local elections. 
he eventually incorporated a new chapter of the NAACP out of his family's home with the assistance of other suspended members. The Davis children said that they were uncertain as to the nature of their father's occupation after he stopped working for the city of Dallas. Ron told them that he traded stock and worked as a private financial advisor, similar to a day trader. The children reported that he attended various civic meetings, but he did not seem to have traditional employment. Ron owned the Dallas Economic Development Corporation, a non-profit and tax-exempt organization that purportedly provided shelter and other services to low-income residents. Various family members were named as officials of the group, including Sharon. Sharon's loved ones describe her as a shy and quiet person with a thoughtful nature. She enjoys jazz singing, drawing in the theater. Sharon's friends said she was the exact opposite of her husband, who was viewed as controlling and ill-tempered. Her relatives said that she lacked self-confidence and self-esteem. Sharon elected to end their marriage in early June 2001. Her family members said that she appeared serious about the decision, as opposed to her futile attempt to leave in 1985. Ron reportedly demanded that Sharon pay half of their household expenses and keep her earnings in a separate account. Both of them were considered spendthrifts by their loved ones. Ron allegedly demanded that Sharon hand over her retirement account, which was valued at approximately $30,000. She told friends that she refused to do so. Sharon's attorney obtained a temporary restraining order that barred any activity within the couple's accounts after filing the divorce papers on June 11. She planned to request sole possession of their home and charged that Ron was responsible for the breakup of their marriage. Sharon also alleged that he committed fraud on the community and asked for control of more than half of their family's assets. Sharon contacted numerous relatives after filing for divorce. She claimed that Tron threatened her and asked her loved ones to check in with her frequently to ensure her safety. Their daughter told authorities that she never heard Ron threaten her mother, but she and her brother believed their father was capable of harming Sharon. Her daughter agreed to stay close to Sharon until the divorce was finalized. Sharon's attorney advised her to remain in their house as she was seeking possession of the property. Sharon asked her daughter to move one of their family's vehicles during the evening of June 12. Sharon said that Ron had an early meeting scheduled for the following morning. Their daughter said that it was uncharacteristic of her father to conduct business in the early mornings. She was awake by 6.30 a.m. on June 13 and noticed that Ron had already left the house. Ron refused to divulge his whereabouts during the time his wife disappeared. Their children said that he provided several different versions of their mother's whereabouts afterwards. Ron allegedly claimed that Sharon left voluntarily, experienced a psychotic episode or associated with drug dealers. Her relatives said that Ron normally belittled Sharon and insinuated that she was mentally ill. After her 2001 disappearance, he suggested to authorities that perhaps she had checked herself into a mental institution. Besides Ron's statements, there is no evidence that Sharon was unbalanced in June 2001. The television program Unsolved Mysteries produced a segment revolving around Sharon's disappearance that was slated for broadcast during the spring of 2002. Ron declined an interview for the show and sent its producers an accusatory letter, which prompted the cancellation of the segment. Constables attempted to serve the divorce papers to Ron after Sharon's disappearance, but he avoided all the attempts. The case has since stalled. Their son told authorities that his father threatened and attacked him in September 2001 after he demanded to know more about his mother's case. A grand jury declined to indict Ron on felony assault charges, however. The Davis children believe Ron may have harmed Sharon, causing her disappearance, and are no longer speaking to him. Ron has stated he thinks she left of her own accord and is alive and well. Foul play is possible in Sharon's disappearance. There have not been any arrests in connection with her case. Number 5. Molly and a friend, Colt Haynes, disappeared from Wilson, Oklahoma on July 8, 2013. On the evening of July 7, they were riding in a 2012 Honda Accord driven by 21-year-old James Conn Nip. A photo of Nip is posted with this case summary, he is frequently known by his middle name. They were driving recklessly and throwing rocks at marked police cars. At 10.30 p.m., when a police car attempted to pull them over, the vehicle sped off and a chase resulted. The Honda, which reached speeds of up to 120 miles per hour, went over the county line into Love County, and that county officers joined the pursuit, but eventually the police lost them in the vicinity of Long Hollow Road, which is a dead-end road. Molly dialed 911 at 12.47 a.m. The call lasted only five seconds before it was dropped, and she didn't say anything. The caller made several more calls to 911, 
but each call was dropped. The dispatcher called back, but no one picked up. Colt's friends stated he called them during the early morning hours and asked for help, saying he was lying in a creek bed and he had a broken ankle and was coughing up blood. He thought he was between between Long Hollow and Pike Roads. His friends drove up and down the roads, honking their horns while talking to Colt on the phone, but he said he couldn't hear their honks and yells. Molly also made several calls to family and friends during the early morning hours, saying she was in a field somewhere in Love County and asking someone to come and get her. In spite of the 911 calls, police were never dispatched to the area where they were placed. The last phone call made by Molly was placed at 10 a.m., the number she dialed has not been publicly released. Her phone pinged at the corner of Pike and Oswald Roads at the time. Molly and Colt have never been heard from again. On July 22, the Honda Accord was found wrecked in a field near where the police pursuit had ended. It had over $18,000 worth of damage. In January 2014, arrest warrants were issued for Nip and his girlfriend, Sabrina Graham, who owned the Honda. A photo of Graham is posted with this case summary. She had told police Nip had stolen it, but later admitted she had given permission to borrow it. She was charged with filing a false insurance claim. After Nip turned himself in, he told authorities he had no idea where Molly and Colt were. He was convicted of endangering others while eluding a police officer and sentenced to 10 years in prison, followed by 10 years of probation, but investigators have never been able to prove he had a hand in Molly and Colt's disappearances. Nip has a prior criminal record for marijuana possession and claimed he began smoking marijuana as a child and was a heavy user by mid-adolescence. He served four years of his 10-year sentence and was released from prison in 2018. Molly was a high school junior at the time of her disappearance. She was attending a vocational high school, hoping to become a nurse, and had a part-time job. Her family stated she's very good at sports, particularly softball. Although she had run away from home before and her family initially thought she had done so again, foul play is now suspected in Molly and Colt's disappearances. A private investigator hired by Molly's family believes the pair were shot and killed after a fight. Both cases remain unsolved. Number 6 Trudy's father departed from their family's residence to report to work at approximately 9 a.m. on August 21, 1996, in Moline, Illinois. A neighbor saw Trudy enter a silver or gray four-door box-style vehicle, similar to a Chevrolet celebrity, in the driveway of her home between 9.30 and 10.30 a.m. The driver of the vehicle is described as being Caucasian and in his 20s at the time, with curly brown or black hair worn long to his shoulders. The suspect was wearing a baseball cap. Neither Trudy nor her suspected abductor have been seen again. Her father reported her disappearance when he could not find her after he returned home from work. Authorities believe that Trudy may have known the vehicle's driver. Her family's residence was located off of the main road and was not visible from the street. Her case was initially investigated as a possible runaway, but investigators now believe Trudy was abducted. She took a swimsuit and a towel before departing from her home. She left approximately $200 behind, which her father said she saved for an upcoming vacation. Her case was initially treated as a runaway by police, but her parents never believed she left of her own accord, and investigators now admit it is unlikely. William Ed Smith was identified as the prime suspect in Trudy's disappearance in 2017. Smith, a friend of Trudy's father, died in 2014. A witness, reportedly his son-in-law, David Whipple, had seen Trudy in his car, and Smith threatened to kill him if the witness told the police about this. Smith was seen alone later on the day of Trudy's disappearance, but Trudy was never seen again. He had his car scrapped within a week of Trudy's disappearance, and he acted despondent whenever her name was mentioned. Trudy's father theorizes that Smith and Whipple took Trudy out on a boat on the Mississippi River, and something unexpected happened, perhaps an accident, that lead to the child's death. Trudy was friends with one of Whipple's children and frequently accompanied their family on the boat. Whipple has refused to cooperate with investigators in Trudy's disappearance. Police are appealing to anyone who might have seen any suspicious activity in the areas of Campbell's Island, Black Bird Island, Dynamite Island, or the boat launch at Empire Park in East Moline, Illinois. Trudy's case remains unsolved. Investigators stated that had little evidence and no solid suspects in her disappearance. Number 7 Aliea was last seen in bed in her Weston, West Virginia home on September 24, 2011. She had been sick with flu-like symptoms, including vomiting, the previous evening. When her mother, Lena Maria Lunsford, went to check on her at 6.30 a.m., Aliea was in bed asleep. 
The child's nine-year-old sister also saw her around that time. The next time her mother checked, at 9 a.m., she was gone. She has never been heard from again. Her mother didn't report her missing until 11.30 a.m., five hours after she was last seen, and two and a half hours after Lena realized she was gone. She said that in the interim she drove around in her car looking for Ilya, running out of gas at one point. There were no indications of forced entry to the house, and an extensive search of the area, including a nearby river, turned up no sign of the child. Ilya's family described her as shy and said she would never have left her house or yard alone. Nine days following Ilya's disappearance, her four siblings, aged between nine months and 11 years old, were removed from the household and placed in foster care. The State Department of Health and Human Resources didn't give a reason for the removal, but it's worth noting that all of Lena's children, including Ilya, had previously spent time in foster homes or with relatives. Lena was pregnant with twin girls at the time Ilya went missing, and the babies were taken from her after they were born. In the month following Ilya's disappearance, Lena was arrested on federal charges of welfare fraud. She and her husband, Ralph Keith Lunsford, who is Ilya's stepfather, both had prior criminal records for various charges for minor offenses. Lena's mother, who occasionally cared for Ilya, died in early 2012. In February 2013, while Lena was in jail, she lost her parental rights to her other six children. Ralph, who is the father of five of the children, also had his parental rights terminated. Photographs of Lena and Ralph are posted with this case summary. They divorced in the wake of Ilya's disappearance. The court found that all the Lunsford children had been neglected and some of them had irreversible tooth decay as a result. Court documents noted that Lena and Ralph had vaguely accused each other of involvement in Ilya's disappearance, the court believed Lena knew more about her daughter's disappearance than she disclosed. Lena maintained she knows nothing about what happened to Ilya and only hopes she's still alive. She was released from jail shortly after losing her parental rights, but later re-incarcerated for a series of probation violations related to her welfare fraud conviction. Lena spent the next few years in and out of custody, she was jailed three times in the five years after Ilya's disappearance. In November 2016, over five years after Ilya's disappearance, Lena was arrested in her new residence of St. Petersburg, Florida, and charged with homicide by child abuse in her case. At Lena's trial in 2018, Ralph testified that they had taken bath salts the night their daughter disappeared and he didn't know what happened to Ilya. Two of Ilya's older sisters testified against their mother. The girls, who have since been adopted by another family, were 9 and 11 years old when their sister disappeared. They said Lena had always treated Ilya more severely than her siblings, and on September 23, she struck Ilya in the head with a wooden bed slat. Ilya's head was squishy and swollen afterward she was struck, and about 12 hours later her sisters found her unresponsive in bed. Lena attempted to revive her, but didn't call 911 or otherwise try to get help. She then put the child in a laundry hamper, put the hamper in the family car, and took it, Ilya's sisters and her infant brother to a wooded area known as Battis. This was in a rural area of the county, off a dirt road without road signs. The younger sister stayed in the family vehicle with the baby, while the older sister went with Lena, who was carrying the hamper with Elia's body. Eventually Lena told the girl to stop and sit down, and left with the hamper. She came back without it, and they all went home. Lena told her daughters not to tell anyone and threatened them, saying she had brought them into the world and could take them out of it. They kept their secret for five years. Lena's defense argued that the girls were lying and suggested Ilya was still alive and might have been been sold for heroin. A restaurant manager from Louisiana testified for the defense, saying she thought she saw Ilya with a man at a restaurant in November 2017. The defense also suggested that if Ilya was dead, she might have died of an accidental overdose of flu medicine. Lena was convicted of all counts in April 2018. Murder of a child by refusal or failure to provide necessities, guilty of death of a child by child abuse, child abuse resulting in injury, and concealment of a deceased human body. She was sentenced to life in prison without parole for the murder, plus 40 years for the other charges, to be served consecutively. Ilya's body has yet to be located, searches of the Vadis area turned up no evidence as to her whereabouts. Authorities believe the child's body was buried in a shallow grave in a ravine which floods frequently and that no trace of it may be left now. Foul play is suspected in her disappearance due to the circumstances involved.